Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session on developing countries, build these foundational space capability, cap capabilities first, opportunities for space cooperation and development. We will be having Rose Crozier speaking to us today. Rose Crozier is a policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, where her work focuses on enabling low and middle income countries adoption of space based technology. Before joining CGD, Crozier was an accomplished program and operations manager with the US Force, specializing in areas such as space operations, security cooperation and development, peacekeeping, disaster management, and military intelligence. Crozier spent about four years living and working in Africa, where she served as a staff officer in the U.S. Task Force in Djibouti and in the U.N. Mission to the Democratic Republic of Congo. As the Chief of U.S. Security Cooperation for Ghana, Togo, and Benin, and as the U.S. Liaison to the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Concerning space and technology innovation, Crozier held leadership positions at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center and Air Force Material Command, where she contributed to the development of new military systems and capabilities. Lastly, Crozier spent three years as the Chief of Analysis at the Combined Space Operations Center in California, Sorry. California, tracking the ever-growing global constellation of man-made satellites and space debris. Crozier received a master's in diplomacy and international commerce from Norwich University, Northfield, Vermont. Welcome, Ms. Crozier. You may go ahead. Thank you so much, Renee. I appreciate that introduction. You made me sound amazing, so thank you. I am <laughs> um, so delighted to be here today. Uh, I have uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, working and, and loving my work, uh, mostly in West Africa. Uh, thinking about complex systems and how to uh, support states' ability to, uh, you know, pursue uh, peace and security and good economics. Uh, of course, through that entire time, though, I, because of my space background, I kept seeing uh, opportunities where where access to and use of space is a uh, would be useful. And so uh, that is what inspired my time here with the Center for Global Development. Speaking of which, uh, the Center for Global Development is based out of DC. We're a nonprofit, non government think tank. So I've divested myself of my US background. And in this project, I am absolutely uh, focused on low and middle income countries and their ability to leverage space. Um, and anyway, but this is the website and uh, all of the various types of things that CGD works on. More than welcome to come check us out and talk to us uh, if, we can, if we can assist or, or contribute. So uh, let me get to it. Um, why, why space? Uh, well, I've got a lot of people here that already know quite a lot about space, but uh, just to, to cover the basics, uh, there's three major capabilities or types of applications that I'm talking about. Uh, there's position navigation and timing, which is essentially GPS and the other constellations that provide a similar service. Remote sensing, which is we're also called Earth observation, which is that a uh, function of gathering uh, data from orbit. And the last part is uh, uh, telecommunications, so that space segment of telecommunications, that small but very important part of the entire uh, world infrastructure that essentially moves information from point A to point B. Um, well, all of these capabilities uh, touch everyone's life. You know, space has transformed from this unreachable idea, if you're talking about the era of Sputnik, to something that is absolutely routine. Uh, it's essentially embedded to in, in every country's infrastructure, recognized or not. Uh, that data ecosystem, I'd argue, is uh, very much uh, a part of the space ecosystem as essentially satellites are gathering information or pulling information, moving it, and then broadcasting or relaying it to another point. So in some cases, I'm interested in making space less sexy. It's just another tool you know, that any government should have access to. Uh, you know, and this this unlocks capabilities in e-governance, e-commerce. Uh, there's lots of examples about uh, how that's uh, uh, reached. You know, every every location on the planet, and and is able to uh, support, uh, especially low and middle-income countries' ability to to function. Uh, I just want to also kind of recognize, uh, you know, those types of infrastructures. I already mentioned telecommunications, but also utilities. Uh, financial and intelligence, and by intelligence, I also mean uh, business intelligence and military or security intelligence, and that understanding, uh, for example, 
the health of your crops affects the, the crop prices and how they do on the market and where those crops go. This is all important information that I think any domestic government is interested in having. Uh, and there's some, there's some frustration when they don't have it, but other countries do. In fact, uh, when I was looking at Australia's reasons for developing a space strategy and a space agency, they specifically highlighted, hey, other countries know more about how our agriculture is doing than, than we do, and we probably need to close that gap. And that's, that was part of their, their justification for moving forward. Um, you know, it's not, it's not uh, uh, just, just the infrastructure, it's also something that can be leveraged proactively to grow the economy uh, and connect that economy to, uh, to the global uh, uh, system. Uh, it can be used to protect resources like fisheries, um, uh, can protect uh, kind of understanding uh, vulnerabilities like flooding, and uh, overall build resilience. So, for example, uh, you can use uh, space-based uh, telecommunications to, to relay to locations that the ground infrastructure has been wiped out. This has been of high interest, especially to say island nations uh, that, that deal with this very uh, harsh reality that their, their infrastructure is vulnerable to, to massive weather events. Um, also, uh, there's a, a technical independence, you know, it's, it's useful to, to not have to rely on others for information or capabilities. Uh, and last part, uh, every, every country really should uh, be able to, to weigh in on this global resource. And part of that are the mechanics of its regulation and management. Uh, and then also, uh, I do want to make a mention about all of those capabilities that are in, in orbit right now. There's, there's billions and billions of dollars worth of uh, capability that is in orbit that is accessible by any country with relatively uh, small domestic investment to build the internal capacity to be able to access and use it and really localize that data. Um, I also want to talk a bit about you know, potential. So uh, this graph shows uh, old space, you know, so maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, if you wanted to use uh, uh, space-based space, space -based broadband, you had to have uh, some pretty significant hardware, uh, you had to have a large, you know, satellite dish, you had to have a very steady uh, uh, source of electricity, you had to have technology or technicians available and maintenance, it was just uh, in the subscription alone, so it, it cost quite a lot, it was measured in thousands of dollars per month. Uh, the new space uh, change over the past five years has really dropped that price down to, to be measured in hundreds of dollars. And while that's still not, is, uh, while it's still not affordable by you know, most individuals in the world, and especially the poorest, uh, the next phase of change is, is coming. You know, uh, the uh, satellite to cell phone uh, um, shift is, uh, is underway. Uh, and some companies have, uh, you know, I don't want I don't want to be too speculative, but uh, it's it's a very uh, promising arena where you wouldn't have to buy uh, equipment other than the satellite the, the cell phone that you have in your pocket uh, unmodified, and that would be able to talk essentially directly to uh, satellites uh, in orbit that act like uh, cell phone towers essentially. Uh, and this is uh, this is uh, really exciting. You know, there's there's uh, major companies, billion dollar companies that are talking, particularly between the telecommunications world and the space world about how to sort of combine uh, capabilities to, to create this network. Um, I think it's very promising and I think it's gonna have um, a lot of effect uh, on, on potentially closing that, that digital divide. Um, and you know, the implications of that mean uh, more people have access to, to data. They'll, they'll be able to see weather for themselves, be able to get uh, pricing data, able to access uh, uh, electrical financing, banking services, uh, media. Um, also, as mentioned earlier, the e-governance part, where uh, and India is really just watching uh, something about India's work in this realm, has really uh, uh, made fantastic strides to be able to reach every single citizen uh, through through electronic governance. Um, also, you know, just having that presence makes makes people more visible, easier to measure, easier to uh, impact in, in positive ways. Uh, there is, you know, there is a downside to this. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, unfettered internet. Uh, you know, creating social upheaval. So uh, it, it's a, an expansion uh, that, that will go hand in hand with, with this data and, and space ecosystem. Uh, while I have this audience, I just wanted to uh, put some resources out there and just uh, uh, here's a couple of great tools that you can go into whatever uh, sector of thing that you're thinking about. 
health, agriculture, economy, whatever. And there, there's uh, kind of guidelines about uh, what sort of free data and, uh, and processing capabilities are potentially available to you. So I recommend you, you check those out. Uh, so this is a uh, this is kind of the heart of, of my work in defining you know what what is the the role of of any government when it comes to space and I'd argue uh, these foundational space capabilities are are the key uh, so uh, in that consultation and localization piece really I'm arguing that uh, a, a, a government should, government space office should have the role of advising the government and supporting localization of space applications and operations across the board. So in terms of remote sensing and position navigation and timing data or GPS, um, I'm talking about data acquisition and management for governance, for land use, for emergency and security, um, uh, transportation, uh, for telecommunications that could mean uh, broadband and mobile frequency management and regulation, emergency and security communications, for the uh, advising piece, uh, it's really important to have a conversation about uh, what, what might be the most useful. You know, space isn't always the best answer. It might be a, a drone or a kind of traditional uh, uh, approaches or, um, you know, whatever. Um, but space is one of, of many available tools. And often it's important just to have somebody at the table who can advocate from within and not necessarily have to rely on uh, outside expertise to, to make those crucial decisions. Uh, the second you know, major capability, the major role would be uh, proactive coordination. So recognizing that uh, uh, there's maybe certain national priorities or concerns that the government is interested in addressing, and then you know, deliberately leveraging the private sector, civil society, and academia to, to coordinate and, and, and address those issues, um, and, and really set up a positive feedback loop between these sectors. Third part is management. So I if, if you, you can't just try to train a bunch of aerospace engineers and then hope they manifest capability. It's, it's you need a range of skills. You need a range of uh, uh, personalities <laughs> uh, to, to put together a program that, uh, that moves forward in a deliberate manner. And that's really uh, the last uh, third of my discussion here will be how project management would, would design and execute uh, an early space program. And then that last part is a representation of regulation. So recognizing space as a resource for humankind, um, it's, it's finite in some ways. There's only so much data that can be fit in that electromagnetic spectrum and how it's divvied up is, uh, is really important. And it has to be uh, managed and coordinated at the national level, regional, international level. Uh, and at the international level, the International Telecommunications Union is sort of the ultimate clearinghouse where that discussion is had about how, how is industry going to move forward and every country should have a say in that. Um, and the last part is, is those same mechanisms, um, you know, account for, for certain orbits that are also finite. Uh, geostational orbit, for example, that orbit that, uh, or if you put a satellite that will stay over a particular point of the earth as the earth rotates, there's a final, finite number of slots there and that has to be uh, uh, managed. Um, as we start sending more and more satellites into um, low Earth orbit that is also becoming uh, more crowded. And uh, therefore, I, there's, there's a lot of discussion about uh, space traffic management and management of uh, a wider swath of that space domain. And uh, every country should have an opportunity to be a part of, of that conversation. So these are, these are words. Uh, basically readdressing what I what I just talked about. So in case you're watching this, you can just pause it. <laughs> um, but the main points are being able to advise and localize data uh, and, and capabilities. So it's appropriate for local problems and contexts, um, being able to advise uh, internally, uh, being able to coordinate between different sectors uh, domestically, deliberately manage capability, expand capability, uh, and also that, that representational role and the ability to self-regulate. All of these roles really give you uh, these, these capabilities, and, and that is to protect, uh, recognize and protect existing dependencies. Uh, countries need to understand uh, what would happen, like how, how dependent are their banks on, uh, on, on 
position navigation and timing data, you know, um, how is their local uh, airport, you know, uh, complying with national standards for being able to uh, land aircraft. These are these are important capabilities. Uh, also uh, enables you to to fully leverage uh, what's already in orbit, encourage the growth of the space and data ecosystem. And through that growth, it sort of widens opportunity for collaboration and investment uh, on a regional and global scale. And then last part, um, being able to contribute to, to that development of norms and laws governing space. If I were to uh, put this into action, because it's all theoretical at this point, so I encourage you to, to just go to the sector that you care about the most and read that line. <laughs> um, and this is not exhaustive. This is just examples of what that kind of advising might look like. So for example, uh, if you went to justice, uh, you know, a space office could support uh, the legislative branch, uh, judicial branch, excuse me, in, in uh, normalizing the use of remote sensing data uh, in the court of law to stop illegal activity, particularly in areas where it's hard to, to uh, uh, interdict bad actors because maybe uh, it's very far apart, you know, the ocean is really big. So uh, being able to patrol the exclusive economic zone is not uh, necessarily an easy thing to do for a small country. But if you're able to use remote sensing data to contribute to the case about, you know, uh, illegal fishing or, or piracy or whatever, uh, that really puts a lot of power into uh, the hands of the government ability to prosecute bad actors. So uh, what, what do I mean? Like, what would you build? And I'd say you, you don't have to build NASA. You know, uh, a small country could really do a lot of this. A lot of those foundational space capabilities could be managed by an advisor and a small team. Uh, it could be a, a bureau or an office that's embedded within another ministry, maybe something that already is doing a lot of space type activity. Um, or you could invest in, in building a, a full agency with maybe multiple offices and layer of management. And typically there's an evolution. Typically, you know, uh, a country will start with a space and technology type type advisor and sort of move through establishing an office and then commit to a center or institute or an agency. One thing about agencies, they do tend to have the title that that says I am ready for international engagement. <laughs> it tends to set a higher expectation for what the agency uh, can do and, and what they want to do. And they also tend to um, do space type activity as well as the foundational space capabilities uh, I talked about. By that I meant like, um, you know, design or manage uh, uh, upstream activities to a greater degree. Uh, different countries have, have elected to organize uh, themselves in different ways, you know. Uh, some have a, a very strong civil society. So it's not necessarily uh, directly part of the government. It's a non-governmental uh, sort of a center of gravity for, for, their, for their program. Uh, many have a blended military uh, and civilian type organization because it's a capability that serves both sides. Uh, some have it separated, like the United States has NASA and now they've got Space Command and Space Force. Um, and uh, the last part is uh, public-private partnerships. So some countries uh, actually kind of outsource some of these capabilities uh, with a with a trusted partner that that executes their their foundational space capabilities responsibilities to to a point. Um, on the right hand side, I just kind of show what some of those different organizational structures will look like. Uh, another concern is, you know, who who would you work with? And uh, there's there's lots of options, you know, uh, working with a, a very you know, large space uh, uh, country like the United States or China is uh, has its, its pros and cons. Um, one of those is that uh, there's a lot of capability there and, and maybe can kind of accelerate quickly in, in, in select projects. Um, uh, but uh, that relationship is, doesn't have a lot of parity, you know, um, uh, if you went down the path of a, a more regional partner or a smaller uh, space actor, there could be a little closer parity in that relationship. Um, and then the last part is, is a, a multinational or regional approach. And this has really grown uh, as, a, as, a, as a viable option in every corner of the planet. And for example, the Africa Space Agency opening up uh, scheduled for 2023. I, you know, uh, South America and the uh, and the Caribbean are talking about establishing a, a space agency, and there's already, um, you know, a regional agency in, in Asia, and of course the European Space Agency. There's a lot of various options for funding and advising as well. Um, you could think about, um, uh, you know. Um, 
development finance institutions like the World Bank, uh, but also there's a lot of space oriented NGOs, uh, domestic sources and private sector, and I'll get to this in more detail closer toward the end. So let me add a little context here about uh, space and development. So this is a fantastic uh, publication that came out in 2012 by Danielle Wood and team, and it really kind of organized, I think, how a lot of the community was thinking about uh, how you progress through stages. Um, this is really, it was great for that, but this is kind of the path you would use if you were building NASA. And I'd argue uh, that uh, the, the current era we're in has meant that, that we can really shake this, this model up and uh, turn it into uh, two major sections. The first part being that foundation uh, or foundational space capabilities. And with that, you can focus on um, upstream or downstream capabilities, uh, kind of depending on what best matches your country's economy or inclination or priorities. Um, and then you, you, you can do a mix of kind of outsourcing some things and, and doing some things internally. You can be part of somebody else's uh, space industry. Uh, so it's a, a much more flexible realm. And I would say under that options row, uh, a very good best practice is going through the process of, you know, pro procuring first, um, but insisting on training or skills transfer as part of that, and then building with a partner in their facility. Um, and by building, it can mean a lot of different things, but you know, doing the activity in somebody else's way, uh, world so you can see how it's organized. It's very difficult. You could be a very polished cog, but if you're not have an opportunity to see what it's like to work in the greater machine, it, it's hard to, to sort of recreate that. Um, and then the third phase was would be building your own facilities, but maybe with an advisor. And then the last phase is doing it completely on your own. And uh, some, some countries have gone down the path of kind of turnkey capabilities that sort of accelerated through this. And I'd say um, there's a place for that, but uh, the greater long-term value is insisting that it be done domestically with your own people uh, for that skill to truly transfer, for this technology to truly transfer to, to something that, that is within your own ecosystem. Uh, for those of you who are engineers, I put this in there as a different way of looking at it because we're all different, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so if you look at the far left, that's an example of uh, what your needs are. And then the diamond is, hey, foundational space capability gives you uh, a strong standing to make a decision on what direction you're going to go in. If you understand that existing data and existing systems are sufficient for your needs, then you're prepared to go all out and do that straight to application. If you decide like, no, we need a, a new, because it doesn't fit, or we need a domestic system, well then how are we gonna accomplish that? Uh, there's the downstream path, um, which you can invest time and resources in. There's, there's the upstream path, you can invest time and resources in. And uh, you can't, probably can't do everything at once. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a deliberate decision about how you focus your time and attention and then the black is really those kind of most advanced capabilities uh, that would take the longest to get to. Um, so you've got the, the green, yellow, black uh, pattern uh, that, that, this, that this tries to illustrate. So how, how are we going to do this? Uh, this is a very classic um, wheel uh, with uh, evaluation, design, actioning that strategy, and then monitoring, and then starting over again, you know, learning from, from what happened, and then redesigning or adapting that program. If I were to, to kind of spool out all of the systems, the systems of systems that make up uh, foundational space capabilities, you know, this is, this is my draft of that. Um, but I'd say it's very difficult to do all of this at once. Um, I'll come back to that. I also want to note that the biggest um, the biggest gap uh, for most low and middle income countries is human capacity and a common misstep is to focus too closely just on a discrete project, the nearest project. Um, and then, you know, once that's done, they don't really necessarily have a, a, a home for those people to go to. They're not thinking about the arc of that person's career to keep them, you know, available to the country or to the region as a resource. Rather, uh, a government program should think about uh, the entirety of that system. So are they also growing people in uh, academia who will step in uh, into these roles? Are they encouraging the civil sector to be engaged? Are they leveraging the private sector? And then of course, uh, kind of growing awareness and capability in the government itself. 
these are the things that are going to keep a system stable over time. I also kind of want to nod, uh, at, you know, at, at the geospatial activity. So this is remote sensing earth observation data and position navigation and timing and a lot of development activity that is labeled space tends to happen in this platform area, you know, where uh, you've got, uh, you know, actors who are who are bringing in data, consolidating onto a platform that doesn't require a lot of technical skill to access. Um, but I find that it's it's a little bit fragile because you're never sure how long that funding is going to last. Um, and it's usually designed for sort of this relatively thin strata of uh, experts who are really interested in that issue. So a fantastic platform is the uh, USAID and, and NASA and African um, combined effort uh, for FuseNet, which monitors uh, um, potential famine, um, which is an incredible need and importing a very important alerting system. But it's it's only talking to those who are you know kind of more narrowly focused on on that issue, and it's not available necessarily to society at large. So I'd say there needs to be a lot of engagement in the entire spectrum, from the the very technical hard research side where um, science or, or scientists are looking at. Um, you know, radio spectrum and saying like, hey, how much, what else can we get out of this? You know, can we uh, figure out the best way to understand the health of mixed crops? Um, because if we're just relying on the data sets from Ohio that are just looking at monoculture and maybe corn and large plots, it's not the greatest fit for the needs of, in this case, West Africa, but you could change that answer for any region. You know, is it is it best fit for look at the health of rice, you know, or the health of mangroves or fisheries uh, in this particular region? So there's a real need for capability uh, that is localized. Uh, and developers are those who are who are you know talking to the thousand pound brains and translating it to something that is maybe more widely available that could be transformed into something that's commercialized, uh, kind of making those uh, mechanical changes, those engineering like changes uh, to, to make it more accessible. Platforms have already sort of just talked about. And then uh, a huge opportunity for private sector, uh, those those products that that people are just using on their phone or on their computer or hearing over the radio because it doesn't have to be just digital. And a great example of that would be weather data. Most people don't even realize that so much of weather forecasting and climate change uh, uh, understanding is is due to you know the the 20 or so weather satellites that are in orbit um, right now providing providing that data. Uh, also, when it comes to satellite communications, um, uh, there's also a range of capability here, and the envelope is being pushed every day on how much information we can, you know, pull up, move, and send down to any location. And it also has kind of sub specializations, and these are all opportunities for a, uh, a low and middle income country or high income country to to build out, you know, their their human capacity, their technical capacity to take advantage of of these capabilities. So as mentioned, you know, all of those systems to build human uh, to build foundational space capability can seem a bit overwhelming. So when I talk about uh, program design, I start with um, really focusing on national priorities or national concerns, like what already has strategic and popular interest. And then thinking about um, discrete programs that can show return on investment in a relatively short amount of time and can be built up over time. So, for example, in this graph, you can see, uh, you know, that data, that the orange dotted dash line is is the level of capability that a country is trying to get to, that foundational capability. The the smooth orange line is the ideal progress over time, you know. Uh, and then those projects are some forcing functions or um, opportunities to provide a clear return on investment for that work. Uh, and then the red line kind of shows the closer to the reality, you know, there's going to be a fluctuation of capability as people come and go as the organization grows as there's some failure, which is inevitable if you're trying to do something new. Um, but overall, the trend is positive and that would be the goal of a program management office to to make sure it's 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 moving forward. So just touching on this again before I get to the next spot. Um, so if I'm talking about program design step one, of course, is is evaluating understanding that space guidance, uh, space related funding is not just labeled space, you know, it's often buried in uh, a lot of strategic guidance. For example, 
uh, the World Bank frequently works with with countries to understand constraints on the economy, quote unquote, and it's a process in itself. And they come up with with uh, answers to that. And then those those are discrete problems that can be evaluated to see how does space apply to this. Um, an example from the World Health Organization here, where they did an ex they did a study of Mongolia, um, for example, um, recommended an action to strengthen programs to improve. Uh, uh, provision of safe water and adequate sanitation. Well, there are space applications that could be applied there, you know, remote sensing to monitor current to predict future availability of groundwater to support planning. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just a very important phase to be looking for these kind of documents and work that have already done a lot of the evaluation of what are the needs uh, that could be leveraged from building a space program. Next step would be to understand what is your country already doing, because often there's a lot of activity. It's just not necessarily harnessed. So this is an example of what an exercise like this would look like, methodically walking through uh, government, civil society, private sector, and academia to understand like what is happening there, where are the existing reservoirs of capability that could help build, you know, the entire ecosystem. You know, for example, this morning I was talking uh, on a panel with the Futures Forum, which is a civil society organization that is pulling together an international crowd to address issues like how do we address, how do we use space for the sustainable development goals. So, I mean, there's incredible firepower uh, available uh, to to a creative program designer. Uh, this is a very quick, uh, just sort of, hey, this exists. Uh, and this is a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, exercise where planners would start to bin possible activities uh, and try to figure out, like, well, what makes the most sense? What is already kind of maybe happening that we can just accelerate or expand? Um, or what are dependencies that we're really not accounting for? This is a potential threat that we need to make sure, you know, we mitigate a bit um, as we're building our, our priorities. Because again, a space program can't do everything for everyone. They really have to kind of narrow that list and figure out what can they do to provide a, a tangible result um, while also building the overall capability. This is a, a logic model. So uh, once you have that short list, it's really kind of exercising uh, and testing out ideas. So if we have certain, so on the left side would be processes that a space program does, and the right side are outcomes. So short, medium, and long-term outcomes. And ideally, many short-term outcomes would feed into some kind of medium outcome, which in turn, you know, five years later would, would have these, these bigger outcomes. And often that bigger outcome doesn't have space again doesn't have space in the name you know it's affecting something like in this case uh the example i used was uh was accurate flood warnings um so it's an if then exercise so if uh, a government provides resources to establish a small office then they can execute these types of activities if they do you know these four or five activities with these outputs we expect to see these kind of outcomes and that builds over time and as the as the planning team is, is going through this, they can also reverse it and say, OK, here's the overall objective we want to get to. What kind of medium and short term outcomes do we need to um, kind of create in order to get to that? And then what kind of activities would make sense? So it's a forward and backward process. And all of this would probably take, you know, several months. In some cases, it takes years for a country to, to really kind of boil this down. Once uh, there's those winning activities, those winning themes that they, they you know, country decides they want to work on, organizing it into groups is, is a way to sort of manage it and figure out um, how to approach it. Uh, in this case, I, I stole India's space strategy as an example of how they group some of their um, capacity building efforts. And then you take that wheel, that, that program management design wheel, and you, you kind of spool it out over time and understand you're going to go through this process repeatedly, where you're doing evaluation, you're designing, you're trying to execute it, you're iterating uh, versions of it, realizing things are working or not working, and then you adapt the program and move forward. And this is part of the reason why I think management is is a cornerstone of uh, foundational space capabilities. You've got someone who is who is driving this effort. Um, let me mention a bit. Uh, you know, what does it take to to grow that ecosystem? So on the left hand side. 
uh, we have a, um, kind of your, a very typical startup financing cycle with that red line showing sort of fiscal health. And if you have a, a new company, uh, they're going to have to do research and development before they can get their product onto the market and they call that the valley of death until they can start making some money from it and then they could potentially go for greater investors. Um, well, you know, on the right hand side, uh, there's there's a lot of inputs that could be used to sort of spur this kind of um, activity for the private sector, there may be various incentives um, it could be grants loans prizes. Uh, say they're successful now they're paying more taxes which feeds the government program and maybe that government program also can use various types of assistance may assistance. Maybe technical assistance, maybe um, financing of some sort. Um, that funding can drive some new activities or expand capability um, and then that in turn would grow the in, end users which creates more of a market for private sector and so it kind of goes on and on and then ideally the government can kind of sit back a little bit and not necessarily have to drive every space related activity because that private sector is robust enough um, or academia or civil sector civil society that it's sort of happening organically without without necessarily direction so those sources of um, financing and funding, what does that look like? Um, first line is, is uh, well, you can read them there, but the main point I wanna say is, is there's kind of a spectrum. You know, uh, Some are more focused on technical advising and some just want a bankable project. <laughs> like just, we just, we'll just give you money, just, you know, just have a good plan and, and that'll work. You know? I wish there were more of those, but you know. That domestic side, I already rattled off a few of those, but I did just want to, I know it's a lot of words, but I just wanted to sort of list them out uh, for, uh, for consideration. Uh, domestic, a, a small country does not have to wait around necessarily for an outside entity to give it permission to move forward on this. There are existing tools that they can use, you know, modest tools they can use even uh, to, to get things moving. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just attended the uh, the new space discussion right before this, and so uh, there was a great discussion about uh, about the pains of starting a business. Um, but uh, but it's uh, it's it's something that can be encouraged at, at all levels. Um, also, noting uh, non governmental and and uh, philanthropic uh, organizations, uh, many are, are are listed as space. And they do tend to be more focused on on uh, even like say small satellite uh, programs or space specific um, uh, uh, knowledge or capabilities. But there's so many that are not labeled space that have a a, a relevant contribution. So, for example. Um, if you are, if I go, if I go back to to the uh, uh, flooding example um, or, or crisis management, there may be there may be an NGO or organization that is focused on supporting a country's ability to plan uh, and mitigate or respond to these types of events. Well, space is often you know a, a component of that. You know, being able to maintain communications with emergency responders using satellite broadband is a very viable activity within this program that is labeled disaster response, right? So um, keeping in mind, having a wider aperture for who could possibly weigh on this is, is really important. And then all of those uh, foreign options. So the UN has a mandate to support space capability uh, and development, uh, as does uh, many of the subsections of the UN to include the International Telecommunications Union that has an entire branch that's dedicated to development. So uh, I, you know, I think it's uh, incredibly important to to be aware of these resources and, and take advantage of them. Um, there's also, uh, you know, national and regional space agencies that could be uh, could be worked with, and other forms. And and the other forms tend to be more on the technical advising side, you know, but uh, still very um, very useful. And and there's always an exception to the rule. So. It's, it's important to spend some time to see like who who are your potential friends as you're trying to expand and develop your program. And then the last piece uh, development finance institutions i'd say the same uh, I think of space as infrastructure, so if you think about who would you talk to if you're trying to develop a road if you're trying to expand your electricity grid, you know who do you talk to if you're trying to uh, improve your use of space based capabilities uh, same category. Um, so the last part, of course, uh, not the last part, but the mid part, after all this work is acting, you have to actually do it. You can't get paralyzed by analysis. You have to just do your best and, and go for it. Um, if your strategy is designed and then has a beautiful cover and sits on the shelf, it's completely failed. 
It needs to be a tattered, well-loved product that is tacked on the wall and scribbled on and argued over. That is a healthy strategy. Um, and I, I'd say communication is so important on this as you're actioning it to, to um, engage the public, make sure uh, policymakers are aware of what's happening and how it actually applies to them. One of the challenges um, with the space community is we tend to talk to each other about how great space is, and um, we all agree. <laughs> um, but then we fail to make a good case for people who aren't thinking about it all the time. So um, I really argue that you need to have people on your team who are proactively reaching out and, and making those connections. Um, and then also I'd say uh, you need to go back to the what stage and, and reconsider how you're organized. Are you organized in a good way to accomplish those activities, those engagements that you have planned over the next several years? Um, there's no point in having offices that are, that are focused on, um, I don't know, uh, a satellite design if that's not the focus of your program right now. So I understand that, that uh, pro, you know, an, organ, an organogram is, is really like a concept that is always revisable. So make sure that it is uh, organized to fit your purpose uh, right now and in the relatively near future. And the last part is that managing risk piece. Uh, and this comes with communication, understanding that any innovative effort is gonna have some problems. There's gonna be some backsliding and there's gonna be uh, fast forwarding. And, and that is uh, that just has to be kind of baked into it. And it really comes with, again, clear uh, communication, setting expectations. And so that relentless drive to, to continue on, the show must go on, right? Um, I also want to mention just the, you know, and this often gets, uh, doesn't get enough love, the, the monitoring, evaluation, and learning phase, where you're monitoring uh, what's happening. And part of the program design comes with defining some uh, indicators, you know, how are you going to be able to tell that you're making any progress in a thing? And that needs to be thought of before, you know, the action is happening. So you've got a steady measurement over time and also not letting it overwhelm your organization, you know, maybe three or four indicators max and you, somebody's job is to check on that periodically, um, not, not have a hundred things that somebody just gives up on because it's too hard to track and they feel like it's not really accomplishing something. So it's, it's a balance and it needs to be um, accounted for. And then when those, uh, when those results come back, certainly not to shoot the messenger, <laughs> understand why is there success, why is there not success, and that why is, is so critical to back it up into like, where's that stoppage point, or, or why did this thing particularly work well, so you can replicate it or expand it. Um, always, how can we do this better? And then uh, that the active adaptation. So uh, maybe there's an issue here, but you know, why? Why is that an issue? So you're fixing the right thing. Um, this is just a, an example. So if I were using that logic model, the if then model, and I had a process where I had a certain output uh, that achieved what I expected, you know, in this case, we, we did provide training materials uh, and to, to university staff that is focused on space topics. Um, in the short term, uh, yes, we can say in the evaluation, when we were monitoring it, um, this, this training did show up in, in syllabi and, you know, it's, it's being used by teachers. Um, but when we looked at that medium outcome, you know, wow, we're not we're not getting the increase in research. You know, why 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 isn't more stuff happening independent of just us training people? Um, and that takes a, a pause. And and in this case, this theoretical case, I say, well, you know, there weren't enough workstations. There weren't um, uh, you know the curriculum we used had this very expensive software that uh, nobody could afford to have more than one of. So it's a very tight bottleneck. So okay, what does that mean? We go back to thinking about um, what kind of activities could address those issues or what should we, what should we uh, adapt. And then you kind of move on and um, kind of go through that short and back to medium outcomes. And ah, now you're getting the indicator you're looking for and show success of this program. And that's something you can really, you can really crow to, to uh, domestic and, and regional and international leadership that, hey, your contribution to research on how to use space-based capabilities um, has, has localized these things for uh, this population uh, for the betterment. Um, and then, you know, uh, I just wanted to kind of come back to, to the reason why we're talking about this again, you know, the whole foundational space capabilities, you know, protecting, you know, uh, dependencies, fully ledger, lever, uh, leveraging capabilities, you know, deliberately growing the space and data ecosystem, attracting collaboration and investment, and participating in norms and laws are, are all really foundational things that every country should, should have an opportunity to do. 
Um, I did want to note that I, I wrote a, uh, wrote a blog recently that kind of talked about uh, that debate about about you know how do you balance you know critical immediate needs with something like space capability. So uh, you're welcome to to check that out. Um, and then if I were to to flip the script here a little bit and talk to developed space actors um, about why they should engage uh, the emerging space community. Um, really, I'd say is a, you know inclusion is is a path to peace. You know, it uh, encourages sustainability. It closes that that data divide. And I'd say that space divide. Um, space applications do provide new options. You know, why are our development agencies trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result when when really you know the foundations haven't changed? But space capabilities offer some real I hate to say it out of the box type approaches. That, that should at least be on the table as possibilities. Um, and some of those like uh, space-based uh, broadband internet could be you know, real game changers and uh, be a, a, an incredible uh, kind of way to, to move forward on closing things like the digital divide. And that last piece is uh, you know, the, more, the more countries we have active in space who understand um, that, that natural resource are, are more invested in protecting it and and agreeing to a rules-based order that is that is more fair i'm just uh, i'm working on a, on a handbook trying to consolidate a lot of these ideas and get them into paper to make them available to people uh, so i uh, essentially just trying to put together uh, this capacity building mindset um, understanding uh, low and middle-income countries needs and uh, bringing some space expertise to the table always very interested in collaboration and feedback uh, so just gonna put that out there. All right, uh, that's the conclusion. I'm really looking forward to questions or discussion. I've answered everyone's everyone's deepest concerns. Got it. Renee, do you have any questions for me? I do not. Everything was very, very interesting. Um, currently, I'm checking the chat room. We do not have any questions. Um, if anything, maybe we'll wait another two minutes just in case people wanted to ask something else or else we'll just end it at that. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Crozier, for speaking with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, one question for you from Samson. It's a lot of information, but definitely can be used for African countries. Have been approached, have been approached by any country in Africa? Maybe have yeah. you been approached? Yeah, I've had great conversations. So I joined uh, the Kenyan Space Agency for their conference this last summer. Um, and uh, in that context, I, I actually got to meet with five or six other African countries who, who were um, thinking about this. Also, uh, GLEC 2022, which um, I don't remember what it stands for, but essentially it's like the Developing or Emerging Space Actors Conference um, was, a, was a great, was a great uh, collaboration and discussion. Um, I also recently spoke to the team in Kenya who's working on developing a, sorry, not Kenya, in, in Ghana, who's working on developing a, a Ghanaian space agency. Uh, so yeah, um, I think there's um, remarkable things happening in, in Africa, and I'm really excited to, to be a part of that conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like we do not have any more questions, so we will end it at that. Thank you once again for coming to speaking with us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. My pleasure. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.